Sunday, we've got a jet ski, you might go get out. If you haven't got a jet ski, um, you're going to get up really early and hopefully it's not cranking across the seaway at 3 o'clock before the tide starts running out. Or you go out to an afternoon fish on the run of the tide. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be around about two and a half metres, but you've just got a fair bit of rush on the run out, so I'll just make those waves break. So up to you guys if you want to go out or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, welcome along tonight. Okay, so tell me to talk about mackerel fishing. Who's been out this season so far? How many guys have got mackerel so far? And spotties? Spanish? Not many, no one for Spanish yet? Come on. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, the Spanish and the, the spotties are, have been started really early this year, very early. Um, traditionally, how, how the laundry works is it, the fish go to Palmy first, they're there for about six weeks, okay? And then they move to, they stay there, but they move to Mermaid. Mermaid normally kicks in around about sort of mid January, sort of thing, or late January. It goes right through to sometimes April, May, but generally to end of March, sort of early April. And palmy normally starts to die in late February at the, at the latest or early February. But this year it's really kicking on. Um, and an amazing amount of little uh, Spanish mackerel at palmy at the moment as well. And the ones at the front here and down the gravel patch, which has been fishing extraordinary, um, are different fish. They're a bigger fish. So palmy's got the little ones, and the big ones are out that way. Um, and then the fish sort of We'll keep working at Mermaid, but then Southport starts to normally fire around now, sort of late January. Um, normally Australia Day is at the time for Southport. And then it'll kick right through to, again, sometimes May or June, but generally April. It's about February, March is the prime time. And uh, I would probably be hedging my bets that for the next week, uh, next month, sorry, um, I'll be fishing the gravel patch. Because it's just really going off at the moment. So. You don't know where the gravel patch is. So I'm going to set out some GPS marks, okay? Mm -hmm. The Palmy, mm -hmm. Mermaid, um, the local bait resource, Southport, where we catch them, and the gravel patch. And we'll sew down on the Kira as well. How many guys fish from down south here? What do you do? Yeah. And off Southport mainly? Because I'm a Southport sort of thing? Yeah. Jumping pin? No, uh, jumping pin, right? Anyone ever fish with Spanish up at jumping pin or spotties? extremely good as well. Um, it sort of follows about the same time as Southport. Okay. And it's uh, a lot better because it's not 150 boats. <laughs> so, has anyone been out into the Marlborough boats at, at uh, Palm Beach this year yet? Yeah. yeah. A few, few <coughs> chit chats going on. <laughs> we had a guy, we were, I left my mate Steve there a couple, oh, about two weeks ago. And uh, we got a heap of spotties and um, like he, you try and get as much as you can to the pack. You get your marks marked on the reef where to go, and you try and get to your spot if you're running sort of half hour because those guys are at about two o'clock in the morning Jeez. and just anchored up in the dark, waiting and waiting and building up, of course. And um, and then when you get down at four, I think you're early. It's still pitch black, and it's like this is disco lights everywhere. It's everyone's boat lights, you know, red and green. And uh, so you just try and get in as much as you can. But then you anchor up, and then someone you know, you know, 40 or 60 meters to the next boat's about what the spot is going to run, or Spanish, and that's about as close you want to get to someone. But then someone will come in between you and him at 30 meters away or 20 meters away. That's when drama happens. And it's a really hard one, but uh, I try I try not to get closer than 50 meters to a boat if you're going to anchor up. So it's all about ethics, of course. Um, when you get down with mermaid, it's not as bad. You might get 60 boats as a big day mermaid. Southport. 20 boats. Uh, jumping pin, three boats. So that's the difference. Gravel patch, I've seen 100 boats at gravel patch, but generally it's around about 50. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, talk about the gear. So the gear I use and, and the gear that I'd recommend sort of thing, uh, three outfits. One is your spin outfit for spinning for spotties and Spanish, mainly spotties. Uh, second one is your troll outfit, and the third one is your float lining, bait fishing type one. So we'll start on the spinning one. So the night before, I get my gear ready. Um, I've got about two or three little spin rods. I spin from a little two and a half to about a five thousand. Okay, I think that's about a four, four thousand uh, spin reel. I use around about fifteen pound braid, twenty max. You want to get those little lures a long way. 
you're casting, like, their favourite food is something about that size, which is only about 80 grams. I'll pass that around. So, just watch the hooks. Um, so, if you can cast a 18 to 25 gram lure, sort of 60 metres, that's the gear that you need to cut. But if you can do it, is the gear you need. So, if you've got like a 14,000 size reel with 50 gram braid, it'll only cast about 20 metres or 30 maybe. So, it's not enough. So, you need to downscale. And they'll still catch, they'll definitely catch the fish for you. And, uh, and they'll scream, of course, which is what I love hearing, is that little thing screaming off. Uh, but that's the top of the uh, I like the tip, and uh, with like when the spot is on, he's been in the water and cruising along, and you see the birds diving, you see the whole water's like white water on top of them. You guys experienced that before, right? And it really gets the adrenaline going, and you're like, um, it's just like grab the rod, not even look where you are, and just cast. And a lot of guys get hooked up by their mates, so <laughs> you hear a lot of stories in the shop, you wouldn't believe. And it's generally in that sort of situation, so always be careful, please, with especially hooks are sharp these days and they go in really well. Um, so watch what you're doing when you can't. <coughs> but when the fish inside eat, it's pretty hard not to froth in the mouth and just go for it. But um, yeah, that's the sort of thing you want to use. Um, have about two rigged up, on, say a 20 gram lure or 25, something like one going around. And something a bit bigger. So there's any Spanish there. Um, you might be using this where you pull up scale, so you use like a, a six or an eight or a 10,000 size reel, 50 pound braid about an 80 or 70 gram rule of that. That sort of size, um, up to about that size, <coughs> that's just Spanish type spinning rods. Okay. Here. They're with the spotties too, don't, don't worry about that. They're in the same pack. Feed on the same tuna or bait, or bait. Tuna's feed or bait, they feed on tuna, okay? So, or pilchers or whatever's there. What size is that one, Doug? Uh, that's, a, I think that's a 90, sorry. Uh, 90, yeah, I'll pass that over too. It's like the old Raider, a uh, very similar version, same action. Um, Raiders years ago were like the mackerel that I always use them, so, so full on. But the little bait fish profiles, I just catch Spanish too. It's 60 grams, and we catch bodies as well at the big size. Um, that's, that bait fish profile is really popular these days. And for those of you who don't like winding fast, and like some people, don't be scared, but some people are a bit unco on winding fast. Okay, not to be ashamed about. Too close to other ones. Um, but you can try. You can cast something like that. Like you know your um, twisty type lures. <laughs> Any twisty type lure, especially this type, type here, um, are very slow winding, but the action's like off the Richter scale. So it's really crazy action, but very um, slow uh, winding. So give it to your mate that doesn't know how to cast or whatever, <laughs> and uh, you'll probably hook up. Yeah, so <laughs> the colour's good in that one too. Uh, so, yeah, so when you see the fish, really important guys, you must learn to always uh, cast with the wind behind, so go upwind, okay? Go up into the wind, turn your motor off or just hook in, pull it back to neutral, watch me casting, <laughs> and cast, and cast down directly at the bait or the, or the birds that are diving. Uh, let's, this is a tricky part, when they're really on the chew and they're really thrashed on the surface, if you let it sink just even two or three seconds, which you should do because that's a better wind, um, they, they can sometimes just snip it straight up and get a wind something there. Um, I don't like to use wire and lures, I hate it, so I use mono and just take the risk, take the gamble. Not because I've got a shot, but that's the way you get the fish. <laughs> it does help, but, <laughs> but that's the way you get the fish. So um, you cast it out, let it sink just like two or three seconds, and then start spinning. Uh, tip down, wind fast. Stop, one fast stop, one fast stop, one fast stop. Just that's, that one second stop is when the nails, as soon as you go to wind it, it's on there straight away. So it falls, as soon as it goes again like that, they just nail it. Sometimes they nail it and fall too. Um, make sure your trebles are sharp. Please check your trebles after the last trip, because sometimes they get a little bit of rust on them or whatever. Especially sitting in the corner of tackle boxes, it seems to make the rust go blunt. Um, yeah. Do you upgrade yours ever to trebles? Yeah, I don't really much, but most of these come around now, I've got to get trebles on there. Uh, but uh, on troll lures here yeah, I do, uh, on um, rigs I do, but on those little fellows, if I'm using heavy braid, uh, I'll put a heavier hook on of course, yeah, because it'll bend out. Yeah. 
So hooks are all as strong as your drag, not as strong as the fish, it's as strong as your drag. So if your drag's locked up and you're fishing pretty hard drag, uh, and you've got, say, 10 kilos per inch on, it's going to bend that hook out pretty easy because the drag pulls it out, or fish out of the drag. So I fish accordingly. Um, but that uh, big um, rainer type lure going around, and even this one here, those hooks are substantial to hold your fish. Um, another thing I spin with too, I don't think you guys have ever seen these things, but they kick butt. Um, these are called Oshi trick baits, they're Japanese. They're made by Shimano, but not hen's teeth, but we've managed to get a few of them. Um, so these can be trolled and cast, but they have a really good action. So if you cast it out, you can actually hop, hop, hop it, and it'll actually do that sort of action, which they go crazy because they can't get it when they want to get it. So they go harder. Around, but, and box, big box, whatever. And the bigger brother that we troll as well. But I have got mates that cast these in Spanish as well, um, and done really well as well. If you ever get the chance, a really good spot to, to cast a big Spanish mackerel and wahoo is a place called Sevens Reef on Point Lookout. Does anyone ever been up there at all? Yeah, you know, it's a really good spot. And uh, at the moment, this is full of um, yellowfin. How'd you go then? Uh, the little bag of stuff? Yeah. Okay, I'll make that up. So, if you want to give uh, that one to this gentleman. Thank you. And the one to Tony. Tony, is that a little pack for you, mate? Oh, is that alright? Right. Yeah, sorry, mate. Thank you, thank you. Okay, cheers. Um, so, yeah, I've got mates that use these up there. Um, this is like a casting on sort of 50 or 60 pound braid or more. Um, but big wahoo and uh, Spanish love it. But, uh, but if you just want a flat chatter, it actually swims head down like so. Um, if you um, hop it, it'll it slides back up this little slide here, and then pulls it back up again. Good, really good action. So pass that one around as well. You can troll this. Um, and the other casting one is a that I use is a hybrid. Is anyone use those Samaki hybrid lures, which are um, good for tail, and use those, see those? They're really good on Spanish and spotties. Um, uh, sorry for this, guys. This fella, they do an array of colours, but they've sold out of every colour at the moment, but um, these are a hybrid, so they're actually lead internal but look at fish external, if that makes sense. Um, because they can actually make the shape more fishy, um, it, it swims a lot better through the water. And they're really heavy as really good thing. So they're a hybrid there, a combination of, of um, like a resin outside with the metal inside. Yeah. So if you've got an array of casting lures in the little fellows and in the bigger ones, and you've got two outfits, different sizes, and rigged up ready to roll, away you go. And that's how you, how you do it. For the birds, look for anything on the surface, even bait schools. If there's no wind, that's the perfect scenario. You just come up close to it and just uh, turn the motor off, just go into a bit of electric, that's it, that's fine as well. And just cast into it, do as I said, one stop, one stop, one stop. And uh, then you do really well. Set your drag, really important, grab your drag before you do that first cast and make sure you've got too tight and too loose. Okay, you've got to drive that hook in, they're pretty sharp these days, but yeah, make sure it's right. Um, any questions on the casting at all? No. Yes? So the power line for mono, is that uh, No, we can cast with mono. No? Because two things are, you won't get the distance, and also you get too much windage as well. No. It's never always calm when we're out fishing, it's always windy, yeah. so um, any uh, wind resistance you get is a lot less distance in your yeah. cast, and also it brings you the water to the top too quick, so you'll know if you want yourself, if you wind too fast, it can skip along the top. If that'll attract the odd fish, but generally speaking, they like it swimming under the water. So you've got to slow down your wind a little bit, or um, mono will always bring it to the top that's too thick. So braid what? The braid, uh, 15 to 30. 15 to 30. Yeah, 20, 15 minutes good. What about um, just letting it sink to near the bottom? Like yeah, farming really good. So um, I was going to do a little bit on that bit later, but if you um, are in a village, if you have to anchor up and get a village trial happening, um, and you just, so just flick it to the back of the the current wherever you're building would be roughly sitting and then just hop it back up. Don't do much, just hop it. Yeah. 
don't want fast. Some guys do want fast. I see them do it. I have no much luck doing that, but if you just hop it, it's like genie actually. You crack up through your water column, and then just drop it back down again. Just keep doing that. You see guys doing it out there. Yeah, it definitely works, mate. Really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. You're not using mono, but you can just go on break with a little. Oh, using mono, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, litre wise, around uh, 30 or 40 pounds uh, fluorocarbon. Yeah. Fluorocarbon, yeah. So, fluorocarbon, um, it, it's around about 50% more uh, uh, abrasion resistance, by, really by teeth, whatever it might be, for the same size in mono. So, if you're using, um, say, uh, 60 pound mono, you could use 40 pound fluorocarbon for the same abrasion strength. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, and, but you get locked in, of course. Uh, also with fluorocarbon, obviously you don't see it, but um, I find that uh, sometimes, if, especially doing what you're talking about, maybe sort of like jigging it up, um, if you get too much uh, action, the lure fouls up all the time onto the line, and then you have to pull it up sideways, unhook it, drop it back down again. Um, if you use a fluorocarbon, it's quite stiff, so it doesn't allow it to happen as easy. So yeah, Mark, we're in that sort of 30, 40 pounds on this sort of stuff. You also want to be able to grab it, uh, I'm grab a gaff. I'm sorry, mate. If you don't mind, just grab us a nice gold three foot gaff and a fish on a gold one, too, please, mate. What's that, sir? And the gold fish on it. The fish bat? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> um, Yeah, I like 30, 40 pounds because generally most bodies up to about five kilo, you just get a wrap on it and you can actually lift them in the boat without trying to gaff it. It's hard to gaff a fish that's that skinny, if that makes sense, with a, yeah. generally a gaff that's quite big. So unless you've got a real little gaff hook, um, I wouldn't gaff them. If you net them, they'll bite through the net, but if I put a net in the hole at the bottom, I'll see what happens because I'll just probably bit through it. Try to get a warranty on burning. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, they'll bite holes through it. So um, 30, 40 pounds, good. On the bigger ones, so in Spanish mackerel, um, I'd be using probably 50 pound fluoro or 60 pound mono. Because uh, they're going to be generally meter plus and ten kilo. Plus. If you do get Spanish on something like that light spin combo, um, there will be no problems. We'll get it as long as you've got sort of 150 meters of braid. That's a hard part. You've got 150 meters of braid. I'll chase a mackerel of 300. 100 percent, I'd say 300, but most of the time I don't. I run them on 50, and the backing goes out and it comes back in again. Actually, it takes them. But 300 is always good because you never really get down to the backing or to the bottom. Most of these little reels with that sort of size line, well, that'll hold 320. Mm -hmm. And the braids get thinner and thinner and thinner. Okay, So um, it allows you to, to get more capacity onto your reels. So most braids these days go back 10 years ago. P, P is measurement, not, not, it's not a poundage, it's a thickness measurement of the, of the wrap of, of a braid. So uh, P1 used to be like 10 pounds, that was one for one. P2 was 20 pound, P3 is 30 pound. Now P1 is 20 pound on a good one. P2 is 40, P3 is 60 sort of thing. So it's nearly doubled. So the quality's got much tighter and thinner and more, much more nicer. So um, it allows us to get a lot more line and turn reels. Yeah. Any more questions on this video? That's it. Okay. Um, so that's the gear you need for spinning. Um, this is well, I'm still home getting my gear ready for the, for the day, okay? <laughs> and then gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. Um, the next thing I feel like I'm gonna get ready is, is my troll outfit, which will be something like this. I've trolled my bottom fishing slash G rods, which is like this type of thing. This little, this little Torin 20, a little um, sort of 30 to 60 pound, P3 to 6, and the old scale uh, rod. Um, my has got sort of, some sort of gear more fitting, it's got a little, uh, up on the back there, a little groove through it, so it locks into your rod holder and doesn't fall over all the time. Um, you can uh, troll with spin gear, so if you get like an 8,000 size reel or 6,000 even, um, on a, a sort of like a jig tied rod, that'll, that'll troll fine as well. Just set your drag appropriately though. Uh, I always stress about spin rods in rod holes that get reefed out, but they never do, they never get reefed out. Well, not for me, they don't, not for you guys, but has anyone lost a rod out of the rod holder trolling? No, it does happen, but not too bad. Um, but make sure it's got a little bit of tip action, especially with trolling these hard bodies, you want it to be to doing that all the time, okay? If, you, if it's not doing that, it goes sad. It's either tangled up in the other guy's line, your mate's line on the boat, or you've got seaweed on there or something like that, or the lure's not working, okay? Um, so it's got to be working really hard. Those lures are very aggressive and really make your rod go hard. Okay? 
Uh, with drag wires, uh, I set my drag. Uh, you can get dial scales, we've got it all downstairs, but you're better off learning in your head what the right tension is, okay? So grab the liner and it's just tight to pull out, okay? And that's normally the right setting, if that makes sense. On those that runs there, it's sort of like, you know it's tight, but it's not going to break the line. Get, get the feel and it'll work for you. Um, so spin and overhead in that little size, you don't need like a, I was the other day we were trolling with a Tiago 50W, but you don't need 50 size reels. You want like 16s or 20s or, or maybe a TLD 20 at the max, 25 maybe, if you, if you want to. That's as big as I try with. Okay. Or a um, yeah, TLD 30 maybe, that'd be it. Uh, so I troll gear, go grab a Lewis for the night. Okay, I'm gonna think, okay, I'm gonna be maybe trolling bait, so I want a couple of slow troll lures, like stuff that I can troll at two knots, but has action. So I might always put a lure out. Um, I troll my baits sort of long way back, so I want something to get down maybe a couple of meters, but I'm not gonna be interfering with my bait lines. Uh, so it depends how much how many baits you want to troll, but uh, I generally troll a gar, maybe a slime or a pilly rig, okay? So two rods at least with baits on, and maybe one or two with lures on. So um, you can get an array of lures, two, two styles you can do. One is you troll a little lure, right? And it goes down a couple of meters. And uh, you can troll that slowly, so a little lure can go a lot better. A lot more action at slow speed, like a flatter fish, you know, you're going to do like two, or one knot, and the little rods go like this, you know? You put a big lure on one knot, and it doesn't do anything. So the little lures kick away. So keep it small. Big spans will still take that, they'll scoff it down. Oh, it's expensive though, but they're good. Um, or you go something like that profile there, which has got like a bib that only dive down about two meters. So when the bib's sort of that shape, it's not going to go down very deep. The more it goes out, the more surface action, uh, surface area it has, so the more it just keeps going down, 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 down. So this fella here's going to have a really big action at two knots. But it, it, this one actually trolls about ten knots because it's got a it's got a trolling plane on it on the side of it, so stuff doesn't get out of, and spin over. Quite clear design. It's typical Japanese. It's very good. Um, perhaps spin something very big. Pass it around to this. Don't die the price. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a jackal type thing. Uh, but very good. Um, and then. Okay, so I've got two, a couple of troll, slow troll uh, lures that run with my baits. Um, or I'm just going to troll hard bodies and troll at six to seven knots. And I'm going to go deep divers. I'm going to go one that gets down really deep because I run short. And then I'll work them out to maybe that type fella there right at the back, way, way out, not going down too far. And I can run at six knots or seven knots. And um, there's a few, like I like repartas, I've just been there forever. And they just really, really work well. But um, the small bib I was saying for that one, they only get down about two meters, but you control it about six or seven knots without blowing out the water. As you get the bigger bib, like that type of one, if you can see it at the back. Yes, mate? Uh, how far out? Yeah, you... so um, the bigger bib one, so this gigantic one here, this is, this is the best color, too, by the way, guys. We just can't get it in here. Smashes it. But, um, so this bad boy here. I'd run that on like 60 pound braid at least, because whatever's going to hit is going to be normally decent size. Um, but that bit there would get down about 40 feet, so 13, 15 metres maybe. Mm -hmm. And you'd troll that down, you drop it back about probably 40 metres back, but it'll come down to about 20 metres by the boat, but about well, 15 metres behind the boat. It'll just come right down. You need to get your mate to pull it in when you stop, because it's hard work. Um, you know, officially you don't seem to worry about it, but when it's just winding in, it's hard work. Um, but yeah, so that's going to be the closest one. I was going to troll a big lure, um, and then I troll something like that with that sort of bib, which gets down about probably uh, seven to eight meters, or maybe ten. Uh, that would be probably placed at about the same length back, but a bit further. But it won't come down as far, so I'll actually sit further back. Does that make sense? Okay, and then um, I might run something like this. This is a high speed one, so you can run that up to about fourteen knots. Just catch a wire on it. Um, they're another rapala, but very flat sided, really shimmy. Um, smaller bib, less depth, kick ass speed. Uh, they're really good. So um, they're called um, X Rap Extreme, and they are really good for um, in that sort of third lure from the pack out. So they get down about two or three meters, and uh, 
that will get down. Sort of place that about 60 metres back or 50 metres back. And um, that last one that went around, I'd probably drop that about 70 metres back. They're not going to be 70 metres out, they're going to be probably 50 metres out from the boat. It's a drama, when, especially out of Palm, you've got boats going everywhere. When you line out 50 metres, it's like always a stress. Um, that's why I tend to troll more hard bodies off Southport or down maybe the Travel Patch or something like that, or down Nine Mile Reef off Tweed Heads. Uh, it's got less drama than someone running over your line. And if they run over three or four lures, you know, hundreds of bucks worth of lures is gone. So, <laughs> plus you're a bit in anger. So, um, yeah, just work out the bigger bib closest, for the same mate, the littlest bib further south. Space them about 10 or 15 metres apart each one. Okay, I tend to run the shortest lure behind me when I'm driving on the, that side, on the side, sort of the starter side of the boat, looking forward. And uh, the next uh, short one is on straight at the back, like so. And my two angled ones are the further south ones. Okay. Because yeah, the, the ones at the back are going to be the deeper diver ones. Yeah, and if you've got them in the side, it's quite hard to get a deep diver out of the rod hole when you've got fish on sometimes. But it's a lot easier with the small big ones at the further back. Okay. If you've got a jet ski, uh, how many guys have got jet skis, by the way? Quite a few of you, which is really good. But actually, I had one of my customers, um, I don't his name, on my phone, but uh, he was in, uh, he um, sent me through some pictures a couple of days ago, which you'll see on a picture report this week. But he got three, I think, three Spanish on Tuesday, went out in that wild sea, and 20 knot winds, 25 knot winds. <laughs> um, after reading the fish report, I did the mackerel, got, got keen, went out and smacked them, and he's just trolling hard bodies around. Yeah, so. Um, it's really good. Uh, so definitely jet skis are a different kettle of fish because you can't really troll the slow lures too well. So you need to be doing about like six knots around about to make it work properly. Um, and because you only got narrow space, so I'm guessing most of your rod holders are that sort of direction. Yeah, so uh, I'd be running probably about, uh, on your short side, probably around about 30, 30, 40 metres back and your long side maybe 50 or 60. Yep. And if you're running two, you run three at all guys. On jet ski? Yeah, more on the surface in the middle. Sort in of. the middle, yeah, okay, so run that one the furthest back. Yeah. Yeah, and always drop that one back last. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's your deep divers. And so when you're trolling, uh, I've got, you've got all your gear ready here. Make sure that your leaders on the end of your rod, you've got to run wind on leaders like um, that sort of thing. Right. In 60, 80, 100 pounds. Or um, with a snap swivel on. So, it's easy to snap the lure on. Um, you, you can get wire traces like so. Um, on, I used to use wire traces many, many, many years ago. Um, but I don't lose many lures. I might lose three lures out of sort of 20 trip, trolling trips in a season. But that's, that's it. So it's worth, but I get a shitload more bites. So you're better off um, taking the chance and dodge the wire. If you're trolling baits, because baits they're going, you're going slow, they're going fast, so they can easily come up the line. With lures, it's like a head attack, or they're, they're, they're normally, if you watch those cams underwater, they sort of hit it on that angle, they never sort of go up the line. So um, you don't really need the wire as much, but when you're trolling rigs, bait rigs, you'll need wire, of course, the short wire. Um, any questions on trolling? Yes? Sorry, Sorry mate. Um, anything with a single hook or have you just... Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I hate single hooks, that's me. <laughs> and a lot of my customers love them. Uh, I find the hookup rate on trebles is by far better. But getting them out is a pain in the ass. And on a jet ski, I imagine it would be more of a pain in the ass. But um, I think that uh, uh, if you've got a good pair of pliers, I would definitely stick with the trebles. Does it change the action or anything? No, not really at all. No. People say it does, but it doesn't make any difference, no. Rapala actually did a, uh, and they're the world's biggest lure maker. They did a, and they still do it, they do a single hook range of X wraps or something in stairs there. And because um, a lot of people ask for it, you know, but the sales were still minute compared to trebles. It's a, it's a few people that, in theory, think it's the right way, but it may be the right way. It's a bit of work for them to keep doing it, but I like trebles. I've lost too many fish on singles. <laughs> Sorry, mate. That was the same question. Same question, yeah. Yeah, so who's lost fish on singles here? Who's lost fish on sing using singles? How many people have used single hooks here? 
No, I don't know what carpet it is. Yeah, how'd you go? No, no fish loss? Uh, actually, I put the nose doors out because I was blue and I had three hookups on the gravel and lost it. See, the this goes the other way. Yeah. No, it's probably better than the other, really. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think it's similar. Losing fish on one, so I changed to the other. Yeah. I just thought with Marlin, like... Oh, Marlin's Marlin. different story. Yeah. Yeah, Marlin's different story. Yeah. Um, with Marlin, the, the hooks are, are a lot bigger, and as Peter said the other day, if you're going to troll hard bodies for Marlin, you need to up the ante on the hook gate a lot bigger, you know? Yeah. So, um, mackerel only have a little tiny mouth that looks only <laughs> shallow, where Marlin's mouth's quite thick. So the gate needs to be probably twice or three times bigger. Uh, but... Um, yeah, I'd, I'd um, so I'd stick with trebles, and, yeah, especially on poppers, I like trebles and stick baits. Um, but yeah, any other questions at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about um, rod angle? Yeah, yeah. so... We've got one you know, place at the back of the stick, and two rod right holes here, and one middle, and I use sometimes, and they're kind of, you know, out it's shallower than the 45, just so that they don't get yanked off. Mm. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, so, uh, like I, I, I had the 680 Haynes, I had the flat, flat roll roller, which are 90 degrees, so they're like that. Mm -hmm. And they're flat, <laughs> there's no angle. Yeah. They're the hardest to get. They're great things, they're fantastic things for keeping your line spread. You get them without riggers on a boat mm -hmm. or on a jet ski, of course. Um, but they're the hardest things to get the rods out. Just trying to get that inertia to get it out without. Yeah. That last bit's a bit scary, you know? The last bit of the, of the buck being in there. <laughs> Um, you're doing it one-handed. That's what you are doing one-handed. Unless you can lock your steering. I don't know if you can. But yeah, um, you, can. you can. Okay, that's a good well, thing. Well, no, not lock the steering. Lock the throttle. Okay. Good yeah. But um, on a 45 degree angle, on that sort of angle, uh, it's not too bad. And that's what most boats are, or, or jet skis. Uh, most boats have the, the back corners are, are dead straight out. Yeah. And then the next ones up from there are, are that angle sort of thing. And at the front, they may even go a bit more of an angle. Uh, all the guys put in the flat roll trolls at the front. Yeah. Um, how many people use those flat troller type set of arms? Extremely good, but just really hard to get out. So yeah, they, they put your rods flat, and if you're using like seven foot rods, we've got 14 foot plus here, two rods plus here, float width, so you get like 10 meters gap between the rods, which is, your lines are pretty good, you know? <laughs> Um, but they're just a little bit tricky getting out. Anyhow, that's it. Uh, no questions on the divers at all? Okay, so, and good snap swivels, folks. We use really good snap swivels. Uh, I use about a size, on 60 pound, about a size 5 in ball bearing, preferably. Uh, make sure the coast lock's tight. So, the tighter it is to undo that coast, that coast lock clip, the better the quality is. If it's really easy to undo, the crap. And some of the ones you've got downstairs are crap because we sell cheap stuff too. <laughs> But I'd recommend you get the ones that are strong, that or, or really it's ones that are really hard to do, but even better. Okay. Um, and make sure it's ball bearing is good because if you do get lines caught up, the twisting's not as bad. Okay. Um, and it just works much better. Uh, that's probably all I've got to tell you on that, I think. I'm trying. Okay, <laughs> number three, I feel I'm going to get ready for the night before, is um, this fella here, which is like my float line type outfit. So, I love using bait runners. How many people have used bait runners? I can use anyone else use bait runners at all? A couple of you down the back. So for those of you who don't know about them, how, how they work is you obviously you set your drag at the front here. Okay? And uh, these are unique products. Shimano designed bait runners, actually JD Jodumpy designed this many, many years ago. There's actually an Australian invention in collaboration with Shimano many years ago, back in about the 80s, I think it was. Or late 80s. And uh, and it disengages the spool from the drag. So your drag's preset, right, at whatever tension. And then you cast your line out or just strip your line off and let it drift back. Uh, instead of having to open the bale up and let it run out um, with the fish on I'm talking about. So sometimes, some people will hit up here with something or some people just undo the drag again and let it run it loose. And the fish runs off, you get quickly tighten it back up again, right? So this fellow, it's already preset. So once you cast it out, you pull that lever back and that disengages the spool. Okay. So it's fully free spool. Uh, you got a tension on the back here so the current doesn't pull it out. You can make it tighter. It's a looser. And 
just sits in your rod holder. When the fish runs with it, it'll scream off. It won't over run. And um, the fish doesn't know you've got it, so you can actually grab it with the rod holder. A lot of fish will feel straight out of resistance and they'll spit it, maybe just drop it. With this, you can do this and they'll know you get a hole still running, running free. And then just, just set, turn the handle and whoop, you're into it, just locks the drag like a dog on a leash running out. And there's no, nothing left, it just locks up. It's the same deal. So really, really good. Um, it's really good. Like I've had, had one of these over in Romp and chasing sailfish once. I caught 20 something sailfish in a couple of days. That's about 100 something pounds. And um, I couldn't, this when I first came out this model, the, the OC, I couldn't fault it. I had 40 pound braid on it. I, I, I gave it a hard time. And um, I mean, it was only for a couple of days, but the amount of fish caught on it and it didn't fault the drag for the good. And they're running about uh, just under 200 bucks for the reel. Up really good. Awesome. And the 8,000 is the size I recommend, that's what I use, because uh, you can get sort of um, about 350 in there, or 40. Um, just want to show the rod too, sorry. So in rods, um, clear tips are really good for mackerel. I know they're like a cheaper rod. I'd rather use a, a nice carbon rod, but you don't need to with mackerel. They're not that fussy. And that soft tip's really good for when they're running around the boat and running into the neighbour's boat. So, yeah, really, really, um, really good. You don't, you, you lose a lot less fish if you're running with graphite rods. You, you'll lose a few fish because you're giving them too much stick and rips all out. Um, but the method I'm going to show you tonight, the hooks won't come out, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, but um, it just, they just work really well with the rod. So, with the reel, sorry. So I'm running like say 30 to 50 pound braid on there, even though the rods are rated to 10 kilo, my kilo, they'll handle it no problems at all with the clear tip. Ugly sticks, Sun Star Power Tips, Unsers the G4s, X4, sorry, which is uh, a really good stick actually, and a little more power on the butt. Um, only about 100 bucks but for the rod, but they work really well. The combo like that's around about sort of 269 or 289 or something like that. That worked really well. Um, so the gear I'm going to use with that, so I've got my macro lures, I've got my spin gear, my, my bait fishing gear. So. Um, in your bag, guys, you'll see all the gear you need to make this up, what we're going to do tonight. And tonight, after we finish on here, I want to take you downstairs and teach you how to do that. Okay, it's really important to learn to do that. So, most of you, has anyone used a double hook rig for spotty to look? It works so good, as you probably know. Um, most guys just use that, they just use one hook. But the two hooks are the way to go. And you snell it, you don't actually use any crimps at all. So I'm going to teach you how to do that tonight. If you're scared to do it, don't be scared. It's all right. Um, Have you used the treble at the back? Not on the not on float lining. Um, would probably work though. Let's talk for float lining fishing. Sort of yeah. Thing. Yeah. I'm trying it now. Mm. Works right. Yeah. Yeah. Probably would too. Okay. Yeah. I, I find this year though really weird. Like some years the the fish are like the head side, and then the years are like the tail side. This year's the tail side. I found. We caught a few spotties this year already, and. Um, I'll use both to start with to see which one they're going to take, which half. It's the tail side predominantly this year for me, and I don't know you guys, but for me it's been the tail side. Um, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So I make up about 12 of these at least, if not 15, before I go out. Because if you get 20 fish, you're going to go through at least 15 of these. Because quite often you, uh, you'll get a fish on, and uh, sometimes they will bite the bottom hook off, sometimes it'll get a bit pigtaily and they'll see that on the bait. So you want to try and conceal that as much as you can with the bait. Um, the leader is only 30 pound. I do, do use 20 sometimes, but I find 20, I lose quite a few good fish. Those spotties this year are quite a good size, actually. They're like up to a metre. They're about six kilos, seven kilos, some of them. So um, if you're using 20 pound, there's a chance that, or even Spanish will, will bite it off, or they'll just it'll break. That one there's on 20 there, so that's a bit lighter. But um, it obviously looks less conspicuous, but um, the problem is that you've got less, a more chance of losing fish. Uh, so I have about 15 rigs made up, just wrap them around a bit of pool noodle or something like that. A little swivel on the other end of them, the lead is only about this long, okay? And um, they're all done. So you'll see guys down there using bits of foam and float. Um, I get away from that sort of thing. Um, if you do want to use a float, uh, I'd use a clip on float or that type of thing. It's good for the environment as well it doesn't float away and become a bit of styrene on the surface. This just clips onto your line. 
a little, I'll show you how to do it. So you just clip it, so you've got your, your trace, and I've got about 30 pound uh, fluorocarbon again, about probably a metre to a metre and a half long, just enough for me to grab and lift that fish in or gap it over to, not need it. And this thing here, if you want to put a float on, you just pull down the, the little green part, your line clips in the top part, this is 30 pound fluorocarbon, and, um, and do the same on the bottom, pull it down, clip it on weight goes to the bottom. So that sits about that far up above your, your uh, bait. And um, that just, you can see the float on the surface. Um, and and the, the pilcher won't pull that under water, no way. So you will see that drifting out there. And you can cast it out. Um, but most of the time I use no float, no sinker. Okay, so I just burly up. I um, have a habit of casting my line with the, um, Burl it at the same time, and it all goes down. And you see, and when the mackerel on, like, you see them swimming the back of the boat. It's like crazy. <laughs> it makes you crazy. They're not biting, but they'll just come along. They'll just eat little bits of burl. And hopefully, they'll just grab yours at the same time. That's how it sort of works. But getting back to the tackle side of things, you need about fifteen or twenty of those mm -hmm. made up. You have enough hooks there today to do that, um, and uh, little tiny black swivels there in the bag there as well. And that's about it. That's what you need. And a pair of scissors or a knife to cut the pillies up. So once I've worked out which side that they're going to bite on, I'll uh, the, the other side I'll chop it up with little slithers, about probably five mil across. So the other half will probably get eight or ten slithers out of it, and I'll just throw that in the water. So they're sort of that size, similar size to the burly the other bait they're using, but a little bit smaller. But um, don't don't cut up and like mid set up or don't use a, um, a bait burly chomper at the back of the boat and make little tiny pieces because you just get the light bait or come up and eat it all. Okay? And when you clean the mackerel, they're just <coughs> full of your, your, the piece you've been cutting up. Um, what else do I need for that rig? Probably not much else. Uh, and that's where for float lining. And so it's a bit hard to do it on a one day, but I got my spin gear, you've got to have a spin gear, that, that'll happen, generally speaking. And a lot of times you're spinning in your belly trial, or doing like the Gemma just lift it through the belly trial. Um, I've got my trial lures, because what mm -hmm. I'll do is I'll go out and I'll either put some lures out or I'll put a couple of baits out, rigged up, as I'll show you in a moment. And I'll trial around the whole pack. Sometimes the fish are, say, northeast side of the, of the boats, and other times they're southwest side. So if you just pull up on your spot, and it's not happening in your spot, you've got the anchor and you just wasted an hour, which is probably the best time of the fishing. So you better have a couple of lures at the back or a couple of baits at the back and just go around everyone and just keep a visual eye on what's happening. And if you see those six boats are continuously doing it, I then look around and try and find some bait in the area. Don't get these burly trucks, you'll probably throw sinkers at you, but get near him and have a look and see what you can find. And, uh, and that's where you'll then position your boat, or if you found some fish that are maybe over there where it's not happening, but you can see the mackerel. The mackerel come up as just lines on the boat, on the sound or something. They'll come up like, um, there's a drawer in there. <laughs> can you all see that? Is it okay? Yep. So this is your bottom, a little bit of reef here, like so. And you'll see the bait here. Oh, there's bait there as well. This bait might be bigger. But the mackerel will be just, they just look like this. They look like straight lines. They're one of the only fish that have like a, not a curve, there's like a line. Okay, or they'll be, sometimes they're facing up like that. That's how they look. And it doesn't matter what sound, Garmin, Lorraine, Sinrad, doesn't matter. Um, that's how they look. And they're, they're really tight on the bait. Uh, sometimes you'll see a gap in the bait. And you'll see them down in here. And that's because they're obviously feeding on the bait. But generally they're sitting just above it. Um, or they're sitting up a bit higher. They're sitting, like hot, sitting up higher off bait. I don't know why. They must just go down and have a feed and come back up again. Uh, maybe there's too many sharks down there. A lot of times the sharks down the bottom here. 
a lot of sharks this year. We've got so many heads back from Palmy recently. Uh, and got lost lost a lot of fish to, to sharks. Um, have anyone been shark this year at all yet? You will. So many sharks at the events. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so many sharks. Uh, but just look for that when you're fishing. That's really important. Um, so anyhow, as I said, you're sailing around. Um, you've got your lures out, your base out. Hopefully you've had a, a hit and you've got a fish at the same time. And you think, okay, do I anchor up or I just keep trolling around? If I get the fish trolled, I'll, I'll keep trolling until they stop or if I see the boats catching more than me, then I'll switch. So as I said, be vigilant. Don't just, uh, just go there and, uh, and have a shot at it. Although in saying that, if you get there early, if you want to get that perfect spot where you know the guarantee you're going to catch fish, um, get in there early and put your pick out and just wait. That's the two chances you've got to do. It's all, all fishing's always the same. It's like, do I go marlin fishing or do I go jig for kings? You know, you've got to make the choice what you're going to do. But be appropriately set up for it. It's really important. So I've got that gear, I've got that gear. And the fourth option is uh, trolling baits. That's the last thing I'll tell you. So if I'm trawling baits, um, I'm trawling garis, I'm trawling sari, I'm trawling pillies, um, I'm trawling for Spanish, I'm trawling for, for spotties. So um, if I'm trawling for spotties, um, I'll try and pick the biggest pilcher I can. So that's about as small as I troll in a pilcher for spotties. Okay. And if you can get those big ones, which are sometimes in, in the monster of packs, like that fellow there, get it before your mate gets it out of, out of the bag and put it on your line. That's a good size one for trolling. Um, and if that one is trolling a small rig, something in this style, which you've got the gear in your bag there to make up. I'll just troll, pass this around. So, I put a bit of lead on the first hook. Um, you've got one piece of lead, I think, in the, in the bag there. Lead's like a rare commodity at the moment. You can't get it. It's no leads at the moment. So you've had to raid my stash. <laughs> uh, so you've got one lead in there. You can cut that lead in half because you've got the big lead. So the big lead in that little bag in there uh, can be cut in half because it's double the size in the thickness of the normal split lead. So half that on that first hook, you just trip on the first hook, it will work fine. But that's a pilly rig, and um, with the pilly rig, uh, I've caught so many fish overs on those things. You see the guys on the kayaks, anyone here fish out a kayak at all? No? Oh, you do, mate? Yep. Yeah. How do you go with the motor, right? Oh, I'm guessing the estuary is not on the floor. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So I'm not sure, if you go down to Palmy and Mermaid, um, even out the gravel patch, the guys paddle all the way out the gravel patch, which sort of, sort of Pretty cool. It's about a 5k offshore run after the gravel patch. So gravel patch is in 35 metres deep off early heads, okay? Um, and you'll see them trolling, and they just catch so many fish, and that's exactly what they're trolling. Um, they're trolling it really slow, like one knot or two knots. So if I'm trolling at the guys with, with that rig and a couple of pillars at the back, um, when I see that sort of fish like that, and I know my bait's up here somewhere, um, I'll actually, once I just go past it here and my bait's about there, I'll pull it into neutral and just let the bait sink right down. Right down. So I hope my bait falls down somewhere in here. Maybe you've got to do it sort of with the wind. If you do it into the wind, you'll end up flying back over your line. That's how long I'll wait for. So maybe like a minute and then um, or 30, 40 seconds. And then when I go again, I, I pull it up through the school and that's. Quite often you get hit. Quite often you, you'll see when you're doing a turn, you get hit because your lines actually sink down and they pull back up again. And that's because they've, it's a different direction what this they're used to seeing. So I well, hit it pretty hard. So the sea bait always back to neutral, let it fall down and kick forward again. Um, yeah, so run a couple of those, I run them along my back. This is a big drama too, when you troll them purely, so you, you can't really troll them sort of 20, 30 metres back, you want them about 60 metres back. I'll even run it, if I've got an area that's not too much traffic around, I'll drop them back 100 metres back, along my back, the longer the better. Okay, I'm really slow, really slow. Um, and I'm trolling the garis and that sort of thing. Um, they're about similar, probably about 60 metres. Um, 
Ja, aber dann da sind diese. Das ist so toll. Ja, ja. That's a little guy. I'd use a bit bigger than that if you can. Uh, 3x2. That was a bit old too. But um, I'll show you how to rig those up downstairs tonight. I'm going to rig up downstairs for you. And that's a slimy bit. It's also a bit too. It's a slimy. So, slimy should be about that size, no smaller. Gar should be that size, no smaller. Okay, so keep your baits fairly decent. That's for Spanish. I have caught spotties on uh, Spanish rigs, on big baits, and I have caught Spanish on, on fillies too. Okay, and uh, on live baits, I've caught uh, spotties on live baits trolling and, and anchor, and I've caught uh, the other way around as well. Spanish on that, on float line fillies. So we'll get back to that later. Um, some of the rigs you can use for, for live baits and for that type of bait. Uh, this is one, uh, it's a South African design. Those guys are really big into their mackerel fishing, kingfish they call it. Um, but that type of rig there, so with this one here, um, the, the hook goes through here and out through here, and the two trebles, one sort of in the back side and one's in the side. So they've got three, actually three rigs running off it. I'll pass that around and troll really slow. They work really well. So what they call a little duster on the front of it. So um, that's, that'll work on all the baits we just talked about actually. Now there's two or three ways of trawling baits. One is on the surface with just the weight of that little that sinker that's in your bag. The second way is um, with a paravane. So we've got guys who use paravanes. Do you, have you all see what a paravane looks like? This is actually a really good one. This is what the pros use up North Queensland for mackerel and that. Um, you get the yellow type plastic ones as well, they're not too bad as well, but these are much better. So on the back of it, you add a big split ring onto that little loop, that little hole there, right? And that there's um, your rig stand, like you swivel on your leader, like that uh, trace. <coughs> that rig going around um, is uh, on, then put onto the split ring. Let's put on the split ring first, and put the split ring here. Um, and then your baits on the end of that, or whichever, whatever it might be. You can also troll like um, that big lure that went around, um, the slow trolling one, down really deep, like I mean, like really deep. So if you can imagine that there's actually a little ring on the top there, I'll pass this through in a sec, and it's got a weight in it as well, but how it works is it pulls from here, okay, at about that angle on the boat. So that's like that big bib on that big sucker lure there. Actually, it's probably bigger the surface area than that. So it just keeps going down, 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 and down, just keeps forcing it down, down. That'll probably get down around about 15 meters with anything on it, okay? Then when you up the scale, you up the ante to something like that below, that size sort of surface area, you're probably talking about 25, 30 meters down. Because we all don't have the luxury of having down riggers, so that'll get you down. Really, like, really down. Um, and what happens is, um, it's pulled down, but as soon as you hook the fish, right, um, and, and what happens is, that's obviously the lures on the back there, other bait the lures on the back of it, swimming along, and as soon as you hook up, that ring slides to the front and pulls it that way, and then it just comes to the top, or comes up with the fish, and there's no resistance at all, you don't know it's on the line. So that's how they work, okay? How far back do you have the bait? Or the uh, not, yeah, that's... You gotta remember when you get the this in, you gotta either hand line it in if you have too long. Yeah. It doesn't you can't adjust it on the line once it's on there, that's it. So for the macro fish up north they hand line, so they just pull it in and their line's maybe ten meters back. But for us it's maybe a meter or a meter and a half. Two oh, meters max. It's still, it's still gaffable. Grab the line and gaff it. Yeah. yeah. So a really good option without having to spend four or five hundred bucks on the memory. Um, and the third way, so you've got um, those sinkers that way, and the third way is um, I head out to barrel sinkers, which we've sold out at the moment and can't, can't get so much stock at the moment, it's probably crazy. But anyhow, yeah, I head out to barrel sinkers, um, I run sometimes two of them, which is like one pound for 16 ounces. Um, if I run one, if I'm trolling behind the boat um, with that little sinker on, my line's probably at about that angle. If I'm trolling with a uh, 12 ounce, I'm uh, sorry, an 8 ounce barrel sinker, it's at about that angle, at about two knots I'm talking. If I troll it at one pound, it's about there. So when I troll two eight ounce barrel sinkers, 
um, I normally get the same amount of hits as the same I make with the downrigger because my line's very close down with hits. Okay. But it puts a bit of drag on your rod. Yeah. But the, it's a great option and it's a, it's a, my, a poor man's version of a downrigger and <laughs> it works fine. So all you do that sort of method there. Yeah. Any questions on putting lines down deep? So troll slow, okay? The other way is, which I didn't show you tonight, but um, how many people have got electric reels? Any electric reels at all? Okay, I won't talk about them. <laughs> but electric reels work well as a downrigger as well, they're exceptionally good. So if you do have the luxury of a mate that's got a down electric reel, you need to run it on a fairly short, preferably chopped off game rod that's got plenty of stout to it that won't bend. And you run, if you run like a 10 pound ball on the end of it, and then the ball used to have a little rope or a clip and clip your line in, so you drop your line back 20, 30 metres and then you um, hook it into the clip and then you drop your weight down uh, about say 50 metres, drop it down maybe 35 and you're trolling, and the angle behind the boat's like that so you're trolling down 35 metres where the mackerel are down in the bottom and, uh, and when you, with the electric reel, once the fish hits it and hook it and comes off the clip you just push the button, auto button, and it stops at the top, it just comes up and it slows down and stops. So the ball's just there and you're off like the fish. <coughs> so don't waste it, that it really is just for bottom fishing, they're also going down because um, I think that's a bit of the video, I think. Uh, there is one other way too. You can see guys down at uh, um, Palmy and Mermaid, that, uh, particularly in that area of town, and down the Nine Mile, and they'll be doing like 18 or 20 knots trolling. Anyone seen those people zip around? Mm. No, you will. <laughs> and uh, and what they're trolling is little tiny things like this. Okay, and about 150 metres back, 120 minimum. Okay, and no weight. That's it. Just that with the on wire, about that long, and a um, single hook. But you've got to troll them really like 50 pound minimum, because the speed, that speed with the fish hooking up is instant snap line if it's like 30 pound or 20 pound. Okay. And uh, but it works so good. And many many years ago, um, back in the 80s and 90s, we used to mackerel fish. Um, this used to be a, a resin head one of these, which was a lot lighter than this. It's super light, so I don't know how it just used to sit below the surface, I guess. Uh, we used to troll about 14 to 16 knots uh, along my back, and just get so many spotties. Spotties go crazy for it. I don't know if they can swim that fast, but they do, obviously. <laughs> Tell it by your you real burning out, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so you drop those back and you just put out two, two only, three is a bit hard, two, and, uh, and get up on the plane. So it's a fuel burning episode, but you get a lot of fish. When they're on the bike that way, you just smack it. And no one else has got that sort of gear, so they're not, and the cheapest chips. Uh, so no one else has got that sort of gear, and that just kills it. So, yeah, there's little things like that sort of little thing. Little metal head, pass these couple around, work really well. So they're, they're the guys that are zipping around on the plane. And they're really secret of those guys. Like you see them, they don't even slow down. They just see the wine and fish in while they're doing still 16 knots and then pull with the boat. <laughs> and they have to drop their line back out again. You think, what the hell's he doing, you know? There's a lot of secrecy goes on with mackerel fishing. Uh, you see a lot of yeah, dodgy stuff happening out there. And, but you learn to understand what they're doing so that you know what to look for. I fished a couple of pro mackerel fish from many, many years ago, and they taught me a lot. And um, especially rigging baits, and um, they troll only baits, Taylor, uh, Bonito, and Garfish. And uh, it's very good for Spanish mackerel. And February, March is the time for out the front of you, and down that way a bit, down to sort of gravel patch for Spanish mackerel. And it's quite a few big ones. Like uh, last year, probably 20 kilo, 22 kilos of this one we got, but um, but. Plenty of fish. And maybe a bag of three, you know, three per person on Spanish, five on spotty mackerel. You also get doggy mackerel when you fish for spotty mackerel. The doggy mackerel are the ones with the less spots. The spotty's got lots of spots. So doggy mackerel's 50 centimetres and spotty's 60 centimetres. But the, there's not many spotties after 60 centimetres at the moment. I'll show you they're all 80 plus. Yeah. Any questions so far? So if you're trolling. Sorry. Just 
Is it best live bait or dead bait? Oh, they both work the same. Uh, we troll only dead baits now. But um, live baits are fine with that sort of rig that's going around with the just the hook in the, the mouth so it can still breathe. And um, no, it's got no um, nothing through its head or anything, just the hook. Mm -hmm. But the two stingers inside is, or underneath on the side is what works there. Yeah. Oh, that rig there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so uh, any questions at all? Okay, gaffing fish, really important. Um, mackerel have really sharp teeth and you have to be really careful, they're really slippery. So on a jet ski, um, if you've got an ice bag on the side, if you get them as quick as I can. <laughs> oh, pause on the side. They've got a flap on them, you can drop in. Yeah, perfect, yeah. yeah my mate Roscoe just bought one of those too with the pods. Um, but. Really important that your gaff is super sharp. Check it not before you go out. It's got to be like as sharp as this one going around. Not the punch out to get, get, get spiked, but um, it's got to be really sharp. You see a lot of guys um, try and do at the top, or they try and do it this way. Um, the best way is to grab the leader, uh, pull the fish towards you, and do a headshot at the same time. So it's coming kind of beside his head and just with his shoulders and just gaff it and straight into the boat. Keep it away from your legs, really important, and your mates next door to you. Because they'll be probably watching over with the GoPro or whatever. Um, back, hold on the head if you want to, um, or put it straight into ice slurry, one of the two. You need to, uh, for you and for it, it's best to get rid of it. It's misery first, and your misery if, it's, if it bites you. Was, was, the, 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 uh, I actually got done by Spanish once, and I just like grazed it on my foot and I just split it open. It's like super sharp, they're super sharp. Uh, and be careful with gas too, a lot of people get gas in them as well, in themselves. Really important with gas is that uh, a lot of people have a tendency to, in the, especially Spanish, they'll, they'll gaff at midsection and it'll take off and rip it out of your hand. And sometimes a gaff will float, you might be able to get it back if you're lucky. Um, sometimes it'll stay in the fish if you're lucky, if you see the gaff going through the water. Um, or you lose the gaff and then you think, oh holy crap, what do I do now? Can't really do much at all because they've got big teeth. So, <laughs> um, have a spare gaff is what I would recommend. Um, but a gaff with a handle on it is so much better than no handle. So even if you've got to make something, put a bit of rope on there, whatever you're going to do, uh, but put something on that you can grip onto. Okay, on your gaff. Uh, on jet skis, small gaff, right? Real short. Two foot. Yeah. Okay. I don't really want to get that close to the water with the sharks. <laughs> sharks are a problem, that's right. I do have one this big, but it's so high. Okay. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah, just make sure your gas really sharp. Um, dongers, the best dongers actually are wood ones, so it's really hard for us to get wood ones these days. The melanin ones are good, but some fish, especially dollies, and that they just about break the bat. They're so heavy, hard in the head. Um, Probably not much else. Okay. Any questions at all on anything? Oh, one, I've got one thing to say. When you crimp it, how many people here crimp their wire? They're too scared to do the twist, which I can teach you tonight. Okay, if you crimp it, um, there's a lot of crimping flies on the market, but they're all crap. Okay, we sell, sell the ones that says that's good as well. We're talking about for little crimps, just for little crimps. So there's only one good pair, and that's it. And the reason being is they close up, there's no gap. So if you look at the size of the crimp in your little bag, that little tiny silver thing in there, most of that, even when you close it up, will just fall through the hole of the tooth. So it does nothing, okay? This, this one will actually flatten it, squash the wire, and spread it, okay? I'll pass these around, they're really good. Um, so if you are gonna crimp, this is the crimper to get. Just so you can see the brand, I'll leave that on there. Thank you. You see what I mean? So it's very tight. If you look at the ones downstairs, the little brands, they obviously do bigger wire, but they don't cater for little tiny crimps. That's what I'm trying to say. So perfectly big wire, but for useful size little crimps. So learn to do that. With your hooks, uh, 2 and 3 is the size I love to use on spotties when I'm doing those little half filly bait rigs. Um, and when you get a hook, a couple of little things important. Preferably Japanese steel. Japanese wire is really good. It doesn't bend as easy. It's very strong. Using 30 pound braid, it won't bend out. Um, it's just much sharper. And, uh, and a little bit more meat in the hook as well. So get yourself a really good hook. So the hooks that you got in there are Japanese steel. 
not made in Japan, but the steel's Japanese, so it's important. They're made with KK actually, so they're really good. Um, oh, last thing. There's always last thing. Uh, bait mate. So a lot of people, like with the two hook rig, it's fine. You can put the two hooks on the on the pillar, which I'll show you how to rig up downstairs. Um, but the uh, bottom hook goes in, we cut it off, the top hook goes in the tail, so it's able to be used without having any um, any help on the top hook. But if you're only using single hook rigs, you really need to use this called bait measure and use this sort of stuff here. Master size, it's fantastic. So uh, what you do is you, and it's cheaper, so what you do is you, um, if you're using a single hook, I'll generally go through where the tail's like that, I'll go through just below it in, in the shank part. So this is the tail. And that's where you cut it off here. I'll normally put the hook through about here, so it goes over there. And then I'll pull the hook and the wire out, and then I'll dig it in, sort of here, so the eye the hook's there, the shank's here, and that's inside the fish and out the other side, sort of thing, in, under it. Um, but the trouble is, quite often this will slide down, that there will be some twist and current, any current uh, when, you, when you're at anchor spot in mackerel fishing, and the line's twisting, they won't touch it, they hate it. It's got to be sitting there just naturally. Okay, so with that bait mate stuff, you just um, wrap it, so the wire's here, you just wrap it around like that, and it just, snap, it just snaps off really the tiny knots with the stuff in. It just, uh, it just grips onto the flesh, it's amazing. I'll show you how it works downstairs. Uh, but such a great little product, just to keep, even for snapper fishing, it's fantastic too. Um, so what I'm going to do is, we're going to do the draw, but then we go downstairs. It's probably about 15 minutes, so go downstairs, and I want to teach you all, yeah. if you all don't mind, um, how to do that. Does anyone know how to dip sell hooks onto line? Anyone sort of knows how to do it? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so I might need your help then. <laughs> you can do one or I'll do the other one. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll show you how to do it then. I'll have a crack at it, because um, it's better for you guys to learn to do it, that when you're out there, if you run out, you can quickly make some up, you've got the wire and the hooks in the boat, you just quickly make a few more up. Um, and you can sit at home and make them before. If you don't do it, uh, if you buy them off, off the shelf, um, like with the ones we sell are sort of like for everyone, so they're on like 40 pound wire, and they're on 30 pound wire, uh, and um, they're not as good, they're single hooks as well, not double hooks. So I want to teach you how to do that. Let's pass that around actually. Um, and how to put it on the swivel without crimping it. So we're going to tie everything. Okay. Um, the other thing I want to do is teach you how to put baits on the hooks on your big rig you've got in your bag there. Which you've got to put the sinker onto. Okay. And I'll teach you how to put the sinker on as well. <laughs> so um, you all understand everything we've done tonight? Everything's good? Yep. So no one has down riggers, do you? No. So if you don't have downriggers, try the deep water method I was saying with those three techniques or four techniques. Um, that'll be later in the season, so around about March, April. Okay. Um, and but predominantly now you're going to be chasing spotties and the odd spanish, and you're going to be spinning and you're going to be using baits like the two hook rig come around. That's going to be your next um, next challenge you get out there. Uh, the weather this weekend, just let you know, it is. Um, Really good weather, but really terrible swell and terrible tide. So, we've got that cyclone out there, um, Lucas, I think it is, and uh, my grandson's now Lucas. Anyhow, um, but it's a, um, it's a real swell generator, so it's kicking in tomorrow. Uh, by Saturday, it's about 2.5 to 3 metres. Uh, Sunday, it drops back to about 2 metres. That's what I said, if you go Sunday morning, I'll go really early, make sure you know what you're doing, but it's going to be dark. Uh, the moon will be up a little bit that time of night, I think. I oh, know, it'll probably not come up then, maybe just. Um, and um, be careful of the run out tide, this will be ugly. So, how the seaway works, guys, if you don't know, the seaway on a run out tide, anything over a metre and a half can break anywhere, okay? Even in the deeper parts, it just curls and breaks because the swell's quite big and you got the pressure against it. Uh, and where it's shallow, it'll just dump. Okay. Um, if the tide's running in on a metre and a half swell, um, you get the odd break, but not much. It'll be on the shallow part. 
So two metres, um, there's a good possibility it will definitely be breaking across the sea with the run out tide. Two and a half to three metres is going to be cracking right across. So that's how it works. And every year the like, little banks change a little bit that way or that way, but that's the general general thing about it. If you've got a jet ski, and the half a dozen of you guys here have jet skis, um, you definitely can get out if you know how to plan and surf, but just be careful. Um, if you've got a little boat, like a 4.8 metre like one looks in I'll probably stay home this weekend and go prawning, I think. <laughs> That's what I'll be doing. Yeah, I want to go every day this week. Oh, there's fish out, there's so many fish out there, but you just can't get out there. Right, that's the way it is. The weather does come good about Thursday. Thursday, Friday, I think it is. Um, it's going to come up 30 knots, or 20 knots to 30 knots on about midnight Sunday night. So if you were out there on Sunday, there'll be a hot bite before that suddenly comes through. <laughs> Maybe Sunday afternoon, like they'll bite when the tide's coming in. You see if we can we'll see that. But if that swell drops back to about 1.6 or something like that, on a running tide, it's definitely able to get in and out. The, the wind's only 10 knots. You'll still catch fish in the afternoon bite, you know. So um, high tide's about Sunday afternoon, maybe around uh, four o'clock or three o'clock. So we went out two o'clock, fish till four o'clock. Might not be too bad. Hmm. Once that solid doesn't come through. <coughs> but that's something you guys, I can't tell you but when where to go, I just advise you <laughs> what I'll be doing. Um, okay, good stuff. No questions? You want to tell me? Yes. Do, you, do you care about what time of day you go out or is it more about the time? Yeah, like it's obviously the morning <laughs> afternoon by it's the hot time. Um, but tide, I, I'm, I'm definitely a believer in the sooner chart. So, if it tells me um, the hot bite's going to be at 1 o'clock in the day, it is 1 o'clock in the day, most times. What's that? The what like saloon chart, which is like a Maori fish chart, works on the moon rising, and it's generally two hours after the high tide, most times. So if it's, um, this week it's high tide about four, so the hot bite's going to be probably in the dark at six <laughs> in the afternoon, um, or at six in the morning or five in the morning to about seven, lasts about two hours. So two hours after high tide, then the next two hours is normally the hot bite. Always on the run out tide. Yeah. Are they active at night? Um, that's a good question too. Um, at night time they will come around and uh, at, they will, if you're live, you say fish on 18 fathom reef, right? And if you should have a at night time, um, they will bite you off and they're there, they're there. If you've got lights on the boat and the bait's around, 100% they'll come up and, and feed. Um, I haven't caught many Spanish mackerel. I haven't caught any out here at night. I've caught on swains, but not out here. Um, yeah, it, but no one's really specialised in it. I know Shannon works here. He was out the night chasing jewies or, or snapper, but they got jewies as bycatch, which is you know, he's over jewies. But uh, they got bitten off two or three times. He doesn't have those sharks or the mackerel, but he believes they're mackerel. Yeah. So that was just after dark. Yeah. So, and the spots to fish, just the most important part I haven't talked about, um, at the front here, 12 fathoms, which is the reef off SeaWorld. Not the one off the pumpkin jetty, but the one off SeaWorld. That's a really good reef to fish, and it's always really good. It used to be much better before the long line is raped or the bait off there, which they do every night nearly. But when there's always bait there, it was a fantastic reef for, for Spanish and spotties. Um, it's still not too bad, but the pinnacles, which is the 17 to 18 fathom reefs out the front, that's definitely uh, the go for the next sort of month. Um, probably around late February to mid March, another six weeks or four weeks time, um, I'd be definitely hanging around the diamond reef. But that's not yet. Yeah. So you get the odd one there now, but you get numbers then. And, uh, and my son Liam, I'll tell you, many times we bag there, they have my two sons and myself, and you get Spanish mackerel everywhere. We'll, we'll anchor it. When, when we've done a bit of trolling, we've got a couple, we'll find it where they're really stacked up like that. And then we'll throw the anchor out and we'll just keep burling up, and we'll do a few things. We'll actually um, put out baits. Uh, I did show you actually bring this here. Um, I, I take a chance again. I like I don't mind when they're biting hard and they're not fussy. Um, I use mono with um, little gang hooks on a pilchard, whole pilchard. 
with a little pea sinker, so it's so um, a bit bigger sinker, so one's sort of 20 foot down, one's about 60 foot down in about 130 foot of water. Uh, and um, you rarely get bitten off, you get bitten off sometimes, but not much. So I'll put out a couple of baits. Um, at the same time, we'll be spinning the burley trial. We get yellowfin coming up the next couple of months as well. There's a little yellowfin down on the 24s, and they're great fun. On, on the, they're in amongst the mackerel. Um, and you're casting and just spinning your metals in, in your burley trail, and you're doing as gentlemen said before, you're hopping it through the burley trail as well. Uh, we'll be doing that. And it's just uh, we'll have a live yet as well. That's what the three things happening. We're just three of us in the boat is active, and it's just non stop. Everyone, someone's hooked up all the time, and that's generally uh, sort of mid March to early April, up to about probably uh, Easter. Yeah, that's the best mackerel time. The Gold Coast Sport Fishing Club has a mackerel comp, I think, this year it's Easter Friday, I think, because that's the prime time at Crony. So um, it's only early days, so you've got plenty of time. It's just a fish of early this year, so you're not missing out anything, you've got heaps to gain, and sometimes I caught them right through to. So like I said, June, July, August. If the, map, if the weather, if the water temperature stays above 20, they'll hang around forever. And as long as the bait's here. And the water stays clear, if you get too much rain, it gets dirty, they just nick off. Okay, that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And the mackerel work on water temperature. So, uh, in uh, like the Cairns mackerel season now is like slow right down because it's too hot. So they like that sort of 25 to 27 degrees, maybe 28. Once the water gets down to about 22, 23, quite a few more go away. <laughs> I'll go back up north here because it's warmer. Um, and, but while it's warm, I'll go right down to probably Southwest Rocks. As long as they get 25 or 24 degrees temperature minimum, um, they'll keep going south. And when it gets too cold down there, they, they push back up and get a second run of the mackerel, which is on the way back. So as the water gets cold and they pushed up, get ready for that. So that's the April, May, June run we get. As long as that water temperature's up. 22 or something. Yeah. So, how important is the colour of the water? Yeah, um, we, like, we kept our dome catching in green water, wasn't there? It was pretty green. But, yeah, but um, we caught on jumping pin, I'm uh, riding the dirty water meets the green, it's not even no blue, it's just been up to raining. Mm. So, jumping pin, it's a unique place because um, you get all that dirty water comes out of Logan, it's like disgusting, and it'll be out for like three or four k's. And you get that green edge along it, but the bait hides in that edge, and the mackerel know that, and they'll come in to feed on it, and the birds will be hovering on the edge. And as the tide comes in, um, it's like an hour or two after load, uh, it starts to push back in towards the bar. And once it gets too shallow, that they just go crazy because they know that they don't want to go inside. Occasionally they do, but not very often. So they'll feed as much as they can at that point, which is about halfway in tide. So a unique place that halfway in tide, if you get the opportunity to get that about seven in the morning. So low tide, say at five or four, and you get, the, get down to about six and fish the next two hours, it's a perfect scenario. And that's uh, any time now, the next couple of months. Yeah. So green water's not a... Uh, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, theoretically, uh, with especially Spanish mackerel, there's a spot he's in Spanish up there. Uh, with Spanish mackerel, they really do like that subtly blow warm water's pushed in, so remember north, northerly winds, even though it's hot, it's cold water, so it turns the water over, Coriolis effect, well, it rolls the water to the bottom to the top, and it gets really cold. Uh, with the southerly wind, it actually pushes the water out wide, right up in close, and that makes it really hot, even though it's a cold wind, <laughs> opposite effect, um, and it makes the water really blue, because it's clear and wide. So it pushes all the dirty crap somewhere, and it goes, goes somewhere. Um, and that's an ideal scenario. So, if you've got um, not much wind and a big southerly coming, they get a bit like uh, happy because the clean water's coming and so the better get happen, the bait gets pushed in closer. And that's what I, what I was saying on Sunday afternoon. For the big southerly blow, they should be on the bite because they're getting ready to feed. Yeah. It's just uh, um, maybe maybe a couple of weeks back the water was blue and we yep. them. Yeah, get them, yeah. And then two days later the stream. Probably doesn't went northerly. Yeah. Did the wind go to the north? No, it wasn't. No. It was the day after Australia Day, the 27th. Oh, okay, we yeah. We didn't see anyone catch any. Yeah, the water must have rolled over then. But it must have been a bit of north in it to do that. 
Australia. I was there in Australia Day, but it was um, beautiful day, Australia Day. Mm. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what the next day was. But if you get northerly wind, same with us, we went down to uh, Palmy, smacked them, went down the next time, and um, it was blowing northerly. It actually was ready like 10 knots or 12 knots early. It didn't bite. Yeah, it didn't bite. Lima's been that one too, I think. Yeah, nothing to be. No. Uh, it's only about 12 knots or something like that. But um, but really, um, it turns the water green. I'm talking about green water when, like, up jumping pin when it's yeah. just not windy, it's just natural colour. Uh, but northerly winds are crap. You don't catch many mackerel and northerlies. Could be odd ones, but not many. So southerlies go all no wind. Yeah. Uh, westerlies, uh, you get southwest to get a good bite. Uh, and easterly is not too bad too. Yeah, but easterly makes the, the waves very short and uh, a bit bumpy. Yep. Okay. Um, that's it. No questions? Everyone's ready to go get them? Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Um, prizes. Oh. Liam, you got it there, mate. You got it organised, mate. Where did you go? Thank you. Thanks for that, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Do the honors, mate. Get the royal. So, guys, um, what I've got is um, the bat. Standard of us with gear here tonight. The first one's about two seventy worth, I think. So there's lures and bits of everything. Um, mine as well. Uh, Liam, if you want to. No, you didn't do it. So, how we do it, guys, is. Um, Did we put 22 in as well? Yeah. Which is... Okay. <laughs> Tony was meant to come next one. But uh, all good, Tony. Don't worry about it. all good. <laughs> we squeezed you in. Just keep it quiet. Um, so... Um, ready to roll? Yeah, good. Okay, I'll roll up here. That's, that's a bit cheap. Just look at that. Just my son, Liam. Guys. Liam. Liam's a very good fisherman too. He's actually just been a barrel fishing at Lentils Dam last weekend. Got a few. Um, so, uh, Andrew Lothier. Yeah, it's old news, you. <laughs> oh, good on you, Andrew. That's yours, mate. Well, Congratulations. Well, <laughs> Enjoy it. Good, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, second one is about $200. Yeah. Number 19, which is Aaron Olsen. Aaron? I always call you Jason. Aaron. There you go, Aaron. Aaron. Yeah, good, buddy. Uh, that's yours, cool, mate. Congratulations. Thank Thanks, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, buddy. So guys, tonight, um, I really hope, I'm trying to finish it pretty quick so I can give you the time. It's normally, when we do the seminar, there's always 80 or 100 people here. And I don't, I can't do the hands-on type stuff. But tonight we can, we're going to go down there. If you have to go, you're welcome to go. But it would be good if you can stay. Just, I'll just get you to do that one knot. And, uh, and just along from the game section to the front door on that cabinet, I get you sort of, sort of space yourselves out, COVID rules. Uh, and um, I'll just sort of get you as much as a four to watch what I do, and I'll just go next slot, next slot, next slot. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Then you guys have a crack at it. Okay. Um, okay. It's about 140 something bucks for the gear in your bags, too, guys, just so you know. That. Number seven. Number seven. Um, Clyde Franklin. Well done, Clyde. Now I know your name. <laughs> Sorry, Clyde. Right, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks, guys. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Well done. I think it's still a hundred and something bucks worth. Cheers, mate. Oh, you've got to watch it, mate. 
Okay, number eight. How does that mate? <laughs> it is. It's your brother, is it? Cody. Oh. Oh. These are actually my nephews, guys. So you know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's yours, Cody. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Oh, well you guys will be rigged up on the same boat. Alright. Come on, Liam. Give so much chance, mate. Number 17. John Irwin. Well done, mate. Thank you. Good to see you, mate. Okay, and the last one, the sixth one, which is still around at 30, 40 bucks or something. Sorry for those who didn't win. Is. 22. 22. Oh, now this is rigged, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> well done, mate. Thanks, mate. And guys, because of that, I'm going to do one more draw. We can play some more stuff here. <laughs> okay, it's similar about 40 bucks worth, so 50 bucks worth. We'll do one more, guys. Is this format? I, I know COVID, we can't do the, the rules are rules, right? Is this okay, this style? Like, it's a bit different for me, you know. And happy with it? It's good. Sorry. Number three. Glenn um, Piggins. Got any Glenn? Can you throw those in the bag there for me? Oh, lovely. Thank you, mate. Thanks, mate. Good man. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Okay, everyone, so. Um, We'll go downstairs and um, I'll get you to, you can look around and look around, but just give me about five minutes and, I'll, and you need to have the stuff in your bag to show it to you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. There's a few things I didn't talk about, like traces and stuff like that, but they're not using it. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah. Oh, sorry guys, it's here. Uh, I don't know how to stop that. Do you have any of that wine? Do you have any of that wine dog? Ah, so, I don't know, cancel. I have a smoke. Okay. Right. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, that's down there. Yeah, in the bags on the table. I'm hoping. Is it over there? Yeah. I'll take the right here. Oh, yeah. Hey, get out, man.